Good morning, and welcome to the Washington Foreign Press Center's briefing on the history and role of historically black colleges and universities in U.S. higher education, the latest entry in the FPC's Understanding America series. My name is Liz Detmeister. I'm the director of the Foreign Press Center's and today's moderator. Before we get started, I'd like to go over the ground rules. This event is on the record. The views expressed by the briefers not affiliated with the Department of State or U.S. government are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the Department of State or the U.S. government. Participation in foreign press center programming does not imply endorsement, approval, or recommendation of their views. We will post the transcript of this briefing later today on the FPC website, fpc.state.gov. Today's briefer is Dr. Harry Williams, president and CEO of the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, who is also a former president of an HBCU, Delaware State University. Dr. Williams will provide an overview of the history of HBCUs in America, as well as how the TMCF partners with HBCUs to advance racial equity with regard to access and funding. On behalf of the Foreign Press Centers, I would like to thank our briefer for giving his time today to speak with the Foreign Press. We're also delighted to welcome Department of State Principal Deputy Spokesperson, Jelena Porter today, who will serve as co-moderator for today's briefing. We'll begin with remarks by Deputy Spokesperson Porter, who has a personal connection with this topic as an HBCU alumna. And after a moderated conversation between Ms. Porter and Dr. Williams, we will open the floor up to Q&A with the journalists. And now over to you, Principal Deputy Spokesperson Porter. Thank you, Liz. I'm pleased to be here with the Foreign Press Center and to meet all of you virtually today. I hope to eventually meet many of you in person as vaccine distribution increases and the pandemic situation improves. I've been looking forward to engaging with the Foreign Press Center as your work to promote access to authoritative sources on US policy, society, culture, and values is so important to the United States commitment to the freedom of the press. With this information on the rise, journalists' role in countering misperceptions and fact-checking has never been more critical and essential to the function of a healthy democracy. This administration has pledged to have an open, transparent, and respectful relationship with the press and I will re reiterate that commitment with you all here today. On a personal level, I'm so excited to join today's event. Historically, black colleges and universities represent a unique part of the US higher education system. And as a graduate of Howard University and HBCU, I can attest to the great influence my Howard education has had on my professional development, worldview, and my stature as a leader and trailblazer as the first African-American woman principal deputy spokesperson in the history of the State Department. It was during my time at Howard University that introduced me to the world of diplomacy and planted important seeds about the need to engage meaningfully with global partners. The Biden-Harris administration has also put advancing racial equity at the top of our foreign policy goals. The focus today on giving the foreign press greater insight into the role of HBCUs in America serves to underscore President Biden's bedrock principle that diversity is one of our country's greatest strengths and to raise international awareness of these advantages these schools have to offer. I'm so pleased to be here with Dr. Williams. With that, I'll pass it on to you, sir, and I look forward to your remarks. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Porter. I am so proud of the fact that you are moderating this uh, today and to be a proud HBCU graduate, it means a lot to our community and congratulations to you on this amazing accomplishment and more to come. I know this is just the beginning for you here. I am delighted to be a part of this program and to have an opportunity to engage the foreign press today and to maybe share some information about the history of historically black colleges and universities in this country uh, and to give some insight as it relates to the purpose of these institutions and why they were created. Uh, my goal here today is to, again, shed uh, positive light on a lot of the uh, amazing development that has happened here recently in terms of that has brought a lot of attention to historically black college and universities. But before I do that, I would like to give a, a quick overview of the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, the purpose of this organization and when it was created and why it was created. The Thurgood Marshall College Fund was created in 1987. Our founder, uh, Ian Joyce Payne, Dr. Ian Joyce Payne, actually had a meeting with the first African-American Supreme Court Justice and proud Howard Law graduate, uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall. Justice Thurgood Marshall uh, uh, legacy 
lives on in the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. He was known as Mr. Civil Rights, a person who dedicated his life to getting up every single day and fighting inequities that exist, more specifically inequity that impact African Americans in this country. And to have this organization to be named after the great one of the greatest Supreme Court justices that ever live on this planet uh, is an honor. And to have his legacy to continue is also an honor. When our founder met with Justice Marshall, she asked him if he would lend his name. And he said, why? Why should I do this? And she reminded him that he graduated uh, from the first uh, historically black college and university in the country for public uh, HBCUs uh, that granted a four-year degree Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. He was number one in his class there. And then she reminded him that he went to Howard and that he exemplified the quality that exists on our campus. And he was would be an incredible role model for our students. And he did not hesitate after that. And he has given us the rights and privileges to use his name, to raise funds to support students attending historically black colleges and university and those funds we use to help students so they persist towards graduation our students still have challenges and it's not academic challenges financial challenges so this fund was created with that purpose so that these students will have an opportunity to engage and to participate in the way uh, middle class Americans participate in the quality of good called quality of life here in this country so by creating this fund it provided that opportunity and 34 years later we've been able to raise close to a half a billion dollars to support our students attending these institutions so i just thought it would be, would be important to start out with that to kind of give the press a, a clear example of why this organization was created and the purpose of it Well, thank you for those remarks and, and to actually just piggyback on something you said about Lincoln University. I wanted to draw a quick connection to an ambassador that I've long admired, um, who's Ambassador Franklin H. Williams, who um, was also a, a premier at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, as well as an ambassador um, here at the Department of State and a graduate of Lincoln University, our HBCU. Uh, before we open up the floor to journalists, I'd like to ask you a few questions, if I may. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let's start off with the history of HBCUs in America. When and where were they founded? Yeah, that's a very good question. I'm glad you posed that. Uh, HBCUs were created mainly because uh, African Americans did not have the right to uh, receive an education. Uh, the actual oldest HBCU, now I mentioned Lincoln University in 1854, but, but the oldest one, that the first one, was Cheney University uh, in uh, Cheney, Pennsylvania in 1837. And that was the first one to provide, but it was more so uh, in a high school structure. So you can get a high school degree and later on it became a four year institution. But Cheney was actually the very first and, uh, and I, my friends at Lincoln would argue that in terms of who was the first, but the four, four year was Lincoln, Lincoln University. Uh, the first, private HBCU was Wilberforce uh, that was in 1856 in Ohio. And, it's, and, and, I, and those three institutions were created uh, in Northern states and mainly because uh, there are a little bit more opportunities in Northern states. If you notice the year, slavery was still in, in existence in 1837, still in existence in 1854 and 1856. Uh, and it did not in until after the end of the Civil War in 1865. So Northern, Northerners actually started historically black colleges and universities, but after the end of the, sixth, end of the Civil War, uh, there was a federal designation, federal program called the Fear, uh, uh, Freeman Bureau that is it a federal program that provided funding. So the majority of the of historically black colleges and universities were created after 1865 and 90% of those were in southern states in the, in the southern part of the United States uh, of, of America uh, with the sole purpose of educating blacks and African Americans still did not have the right to attend uh, a historically white institution. It was Thurgood Marshall who argued Brown versus the Board of Education uh, to desegregate 
education in general that when that started changing uh, in this country. So HBCUs have been around for over 150 years. Uh, they have without HBCUs, and this is the point uh, that I would like to make, without HBCUs, there would not be a black middle class as we know it today. Uh, HBCUs produced, uh, uh, has produced and continue to produce doctors, lawyers, all the professional classes, teachers, educators, uh, nurses, you name it. They were created on it, on it started um, because of historically black colleges and universities. So we only represent about less than 3% of colleges and universities in the country, but the impact is significant in terms of what we have done uh, in America. So yeah, I'd, I'd like, I have two questions because you raised so many important details about the history. You mentioned Lincoln University and the black middle class and democracy in America. So tell us why HBCUs play an important role in America today. Yeah, I, I think the, the role that HBCUs continue to play, first of all, we serve a population of students that still uh, in, a, in, a, in a large sense, the first in their family to go to college. Uh, we still serve a large percentage of students who have financial challenges. Uh, come for, they still come from communities that uh, have inequities. This pandemic that we have we are going through right now, and the social unrest that's taking place in our country right now, actually has put a spotlight on the inequities that exist within the African American community. And it's been very clear that the the health disparities, the educational disparities, all that was put a spotlight on historically black colleges and universities. And this country uh, had to deal with this and they have uh, responded in a very positive way in terms of corporate America, in terms of federal government and providing additional resources to support these institutions in a way that, have, that they have never been supported uh, from that perspective. And HBCU graduates, uh, they are in the members of Congress. I know you work for ones. I uh, yeah. remember uh, former Congressman Cedric Richmond, Morehouse graduate, now senior policy uh, analyst for uh, advisor for our current president, President Biden, uh, someone who strongly advocate uh, for HBCUs in a way that we have never had this type of advocacy uh, from this perspective that, and, and it put this spotlight. And we all know uh, the wonderful news of Howard grad, Vice President Kamala Harris and what in her, uh, uh, when she uh, actually, when she was running uh, for the presidency, uh, she made her announcement that she was going to run for the president and then the presidency. And then the next meeting was on the campus of Howard University. The reason why I know that is because my son was there at a basketball game and she walked in uh, with the president of the university. So that right there just elevated uh, historically black colleges, university to, a, to a, in a spotlight that we've never had. We've always known that these institutions are powerful. These institutions have played a, a critical role in shaping America in a way, in a positive and a very strategic way. But now the spotlight is on us and now the spotlight is a way that we can continue to, to promote and brag about the wonderful things that's happening on these amazing campuses. There are 101 uh, HBCUs in this country uh, representing a little over 300,000 students and 80% of the students who attend historically black colleges and universities, they will attend a public historically black college and university. And that's some H, uh, Thurgood Marshall representing the public. Uh, the remaining 20% uh, students attend private HBCUs, but they're still together as it relates to the historical nature of these institutions. Thank you so much for sharing that. And now let's move on to the international stage. So what should international media tell their audiences uh, at home about the opportunities presented by HBCUs? Yeah, I'm glad you, you, um, you posed that question. And if you go to our campuses, you will see that we're one of the most diverse uh, campuses in the world as it relates to uh, students. Not only do we have students from America, we do have students from all over the world all over Africa, Caribbeans, China, Europe, you name it, they are on our campuses. The one thing that I can say that is, that is clear, we have never, let me underscore this, we have never denied anyone access to an education. Uh, we have been denied access to an education, but we have never, HBCUs have never said no to any race, any 
a country, anyone that, that, that have an interest in pursuing a higher higher education degree. And we have all the professional programs that you can you can uh, pursue if you're interested in law, you're interested in medicine, you're interested in, in architecture, you're interested in education. We have it on our campus and our students are thriving in those areas. So I would encourage uh, our foreign uh, friends if they are interested in a quality education, uh, you can look at our institution and, and the richness of the history that's associated with an HBCU. I can't explain it, you know, in terms of it's a feeling that you have. And Ms. Porter, I know you know what I'm talking about. I know in exactly terms of what that, you're talking about. <laughs> in terms of that process. Well, I, I thank you for underscoring that HBCUs, again, and an emphasis on historically, the first um, word in, in the acronym. It's, it's historically for Black and African Americans because, again, we were excluded from higher education. We were excluded from um, other areas of America. And so we had to make our own. Um, but with that, I had, from personal experience, I had several friends and classmates and then people who went to Howard with me who were of South Asian and East Asian descent and who were very strong, proud bison just like me. And it was wonderful to see that. And again, it's prevalent at other HBCUs as well. Now, let's talk a little bit more about um, what your organization is doing. As you know, there are students all over the country, no matter what ethnic background they come from, they have financial troubles. And of course, some African-American students face challenges with regard to access to funding for higher education. So will you tell us more about the work of the Third Good College Mar Marshall Fund to address those issues? Yes, uh, one of the things that, I, as I mentioned, the purpose of this organization was not only to provide uh, financial resources to support students, but also provide them with opportunities uh, to uh, secure amazing opportunities in corporate America. Uh, we recognize very clearly uh, in this country, as you all know, it's about access and having the ability to, to, to put your talent on display and having someone to be able to take a look at you. And, and we know in this country, some of our corporate partners are looking to diversify their, their companies. And part of diversity is making sure you have people from a wide variety of viewpoints, wide, wide variety of perspectives. And HBCU uh, is a place where, where companies look to in terms of their diverse talent. And so what we have been able to do here at the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, we've been able to partner with some of the top Fortune uh, 100 companies in America and providing our students with a what we call a door opener. Uh, but then we're not, it's not a handout. We're not providing anybody with anything that someone is not, um, that they are not, they haven't been able to earn. Uh, it's, it's an opportunity. And, and that's what uh, equity is all about. It's about fairness. It's about creating those opportunities that, that, that some of us may not have access to. So HBCUs and working with our corporate partners, we've been able to um, introduce uh, major corporations to the talent that exists on our campus in a unique way and bringing our students uh, out and interviewing for internships so that they can not only uh, achieve an opportunity with the internship, but also securing a, a job after graduation. Because one of the things that we are interested in is narrowing the wealth gap between uh, blacks and, Af and whites in this country. And we're still at the bottom when you look at wealth in this country. African-Americans are still at the bottom when it comes to uh, financial wealth. And education, and Thurgood Marshall argue this, education is the key of lifting uh, our people up out of their current situation. And by providing educational opportunities, you have an opportunity to not only get an education, but also to advance. And one degree, taking someone that's been, uh, that might be the first in their family to go to college and taking them out of that situation, it changes the whole entire family structure from that perspective. And it provides uh, economic opportunities for, for, for their growth. So improving and increasing the number of African-Americans getting into the middle class, and that helps America, and that makes America continue to, to move in a very positive and strong way. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I want to go back to what you mentioned about Vice President Harris before. And so, of course, her election has brought renewed attention to HBCUs. So can you tell us more about how the Thurgood Marshall Fund has partnered with the Vice President on policy issues? such as building capacity for research and workforce preparation for students? 
Yeah, so one of the things that we we have been very strategic in working with the current administration and, and um, as you referenced earlier in, in my introduction about uh, that I spent some time in Delaware. And as you know, the president is a Delawarean. And right before I left uh, Delaware State, we invited him to be our commencement speaker. And he was a commencement speaker uh, at Delaware State. And so he has a clear understanding of HBCUs. And I think that makes a major, major difference. And he has an understanding that of their value coming from a state that's got a proud HBCU there and coming being a former senator there and understanding the importance of connecting and what that institutions have done what from an economic standpoint what that institution is doing for that particular state so that that puts a different perspective on it and to have uh the vice president there who who understand clearly the importance of having research dollars as you know your institution is a major research institution but in order in order for that institution to continue to grow and thrive research dollars coming from the federal government could play a critical role in building capacity for those institutions so by having someone like that and having the the, the president to put to have a platform and to make it very clear that the values of HBCUs uh, play, a, that the importance of HBCUs play a critical role in advancing America. Uh, he made it very clear that he was going to make over $70 billion of investment in historically black colleges and universities. And that was, that's part of his platform. And we've been very um, deliberate in working with him. And, and, you know, he's got a lot on his plate right now, but we've had meetings with with the White House, we've met with your former boss, uh, Cedric Richmond, who's who's been the point person on this, and we are very, very encouraged uh, about what this administration will do to support uh, historically black colleges and universities. As you know, the Thurgood Marshall College Fund is bipartisan, so we don't pick sides. Uh, we work with both administrations. We work with both sides. We got two bills. Uh, passed this uh, past uh, Congress, the 116th Congress, uh, and it was a bipartisan bill uh, that got passed. And, and there was no way it was going to be able to get passed without uh, bipartisan support. It was the Futures Act and the HBCU Partners Act, two major laws that that was des that have been designated to support uh, historically black colleges and universities in this country. Thank you for sharing that. I remember quite well working with my old boss on the, on the Futures Act. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for your time and thank you for letting me ask you questions. And now we can turn it over to Liz so we can hear from the journalists. Thank yes, you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And thank you, Deputy Spokesperson Porter for that great discussion. And now we'll start the Q&A with our participating journalists. For our journalists, if you have not already done so, please take the time now to rename your Zoom profile with your full name and the name of your media outlet. If you have a question, you can virtually raise your hand via the participant field or you're also welcome to submit questions via the chat function, and I will read them. And I'll now start with our first question from Pearl Matibe from South Africa. Go ahead, Pearl. Please unmute yourself and uh, you. you're welcome to turn on your camera. Yes. Um, thank you so much for, um, for making yourself available and the information that you have shared. Um, I have a, a, a question. I guess I'm wondering, uh, for example, um, in term, I know Howard University has a very strong uh, Russian department, and this is an interest of mine. I am learning Russian, um, but at uh, George Mason University, but I wondered, given the historical ties with the civil rights movement and at the time the USSR, uh, there is not yet a large number of women, uh, African-American women who are, for example, in the uh, peace and security field uh, and may be tied with a foreign language, as you might know, critical, langu critical languages such as Russian uh, are important and there is the percentage of African-Americans in this field, in the country. Maybe you might speak to that. I, I see on your website, you talk about that you, the, the funding is for all classification of students, but could you explain what that means when you say all classifications? What's contained in that bucket of all classification of students? And is there any emphasis on students studying Russian and aiming for uh, security studies? Thanks. 
Well, thank you for that question. And, and it's a very good question. It's a very important question. Uh, we, we have um, institutions that do offer uh, strong foreign language programs. And what I would encourage you to do to, to do exactly what you did is go to our website and look at those institutions. And we have a link of those uh, from, from uh, listed. Uh, but the majority of our students that, that uh, attend our institutions a large percentage of those students are, are science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics majors, STEM majors, uh, and which, as you know, is a underrepresented uh, area for for African Americans. So we there's a there's a big emphasis on STEM. Uh, we do have liberal arts uh, institutions that will have strong foreign language programs some of them some of those institutions will link their uh, programs with bigger institutions in terms of partnerships uh, from that perspective and and i don't have a list of those with me right now but you can go to our website and and and, uh, and look at the institutions that are listed there uh, for and then inquire to get a little little bit more information on that as far as our programs that we offer uh, through the Thurgood Marshall College Fund what we when we say cla all classifications we're specifically talking about uh, from freshman year right on up to graduate school uh, and we do have some very specific programs uh, that are focused on as I in indicated earlier stem but we do have some that will allow you to use the funds for general majors, uh, liberal arts majors uh, from that perspective. And all that is listed uh, on, our, on our website uh, from, that from that viewpoint. And if Pearl, I can take the second part of your question, noting um, African-American women who, um, it, it, I think you noted that there was a smaller cohort of African-American women who were in the peace and security field, similar to um, what you know, Dr. Williams has already said about the history of HBCUs is how we started to form our own universities because we were left out. In recent years, you know, women like me who are in you know women peace and security and who are uh, African American women started to form our own. So, and I just want to highlight someone who's actually with her uh, her uh, confirmation pending, Ambassador um, Bonnie Jenkins, who formed an organization called Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security, of which. I'm a member of and have have been since the founding in 2017 and there are and it was it's an organization that's actually global we there are chapters in europe there are chapters um all over the country and it's still growing and so i'd, I'd charge you to look into that too because we there are plenty of us we have ambassador linda thomas greenfield who like me is a southern lady and, and preaches her her uh, gumbo diplomacy as we like to say we have ambassador spratlin who just started here and several others down the list and others throughout history but it seems we were probably not given the same opportunities in light because again, we had really no place to convene except for organizations that were recently founded. So I would also suggest you, you look into that as well since it's a global organization. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just looking to see if we have additional questions from our journalists. Doesn't look like anyone else has any questions. I think we asked such wonderful questions, <laughs> Jelena. Uh, and uh, thank you, Dr. Williams. This has been an incredibly informative briefing. And I think we have now come to the end. So I would like to thank you for giving your time today to this timely and important topic and to Principal Deputy Spokesperson Porter for co-moderating the discussion. As a reminder, the transcript and the video of this briefing will be posted later today on the FPC website, fpc.state.gov. Thank you and good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.